The History Things podcast is brought to you by HistoryNet, publisher of nine different historical magazines, including the Civil War Times, American History, and Military History. Visit HistoryNet.com to learn more or follow them on social media by searching for at history underscore net. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Are you ready? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the History Things Podcast. Very excited to be here. I'm your host, Pat McGuire. Join, uh, joining me as always, I'm stumbling right out of the thing, uh, votes well for everything, is my co-host uh, with the most of Matt Borders, uh, a major author, historian. It's good to be back in the studio. It's good to be doing a video chat tonight. Absolutely. I'm very excited we have an awesome guest with us, uh, somebody that we've been big fans of for a very long time, following them on social media, uh, and the really awesome work they're doing. It's very unique when you consider the world we live in right. as Civil War and World War One historians, kind of the same mud and the same battle lines over and over again. Breath of fresh air tonight, folks. We're having a great conversation. Joining us all the way from the Volunteer State is Miss Sarah Morgan, host of Cooking with the First Ladies. If you're not following her on Instagram, shame on you. You should be. Uh, one of the coolest accounts you can follow. You learn a lot and you get your belly full in the process. Sarah, thank you for joining us today on the History Things Podcast. How are you? I'm great. I'm so excited to um, finally be on your show because I love your podcast. So thank you, so thank you very much. Happy to have you here. Uh, obviously, planning uh, to get to this episode, we've been just tripping over our excitement. We're so excited to finally be here to uh, have this chat officially today. So um, let's start with you. We've always wanted to, to introduce uh, who we're talking to, to our listeners, to our viewers. So let's start with, with you, Sarah. Uh, what? Just tell us about how you got into history, if you want, and then tell us a little bit about how cooking with the First Ladies sort of became yeah. uh, in, in existence. Your origin story. Yes. Okay. We're the origin yeah. story. Okay. Uh, well, I think I really got into history um, pretty early on in life. Um, when I was really young and just introduced to the story of um, Anne Frank specifically, um, I just really got into it. Um, and just sort of that started my love of research, which I know a lot of people don't like, but I am a huge researcher. Um, and so I really think, yeah, Anne Frank was kind of my starting point of loving history and that was way back in elementary school um and then uh funny enough probably uh titanic when that yes. came out um i was obsessed with the movie um i won't we even get are. into it we still are fair. there were fist bumps all around this studio when you just said that because yeah. we can't uh, let it go we covered it in season one we're still talking yeah. about it in season four it's oh. true so welcome to the titanic club sarah well then um just so that everybody can know that I, you know, whatever. I, I went to the movie theater 14 times. Yes. Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, you yes. are a certified expert. We have to ask <laughs> definitively, was there room on the headboard for that? <laughs> Uh, yes, there absolutely was. And I don't care what James Cameron has said that there wasn't. There yeah, was. he's, he's been defending that pretty aggressively again recently. It's my, yeah. it's my dearest friend, Jim, because we, again, we cover this. I know him very personally. And I have told him he is a bastard. Jack could have lived. <laughs> and he just, essentially, he's, his blood is on Jim Cameron's hands. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you for, for being a person of reason, Sarah, right out of the gate. <laughs> um, it's this a episode over, we settled it finally once and for all. There was room for Jack. That's the whole point of this podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Sorry, I'm <laughs> it's over. Okay. So 14 times, though, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and I, well, and I was in middle school. So um, shout out to my mom and my dad who yes. took turns taking me that many times. So <laughs> uh, put them through that. I'm pretty sure my dad probably slept through it <laughs> multiple times. But yeah. um, 
anyway, so that, and so then I just really got into that and the history of it. And then also kind of in that same time of the movie coming out, um, my seventh grade, uh, history teacher was awesome. Um, mm. just had really awesome projects, like really hands-on artsy projects, which I'm really into. You want to um, shout out their name, Sarah? Do, can we, cause we like to shout out good teachers. Do you want to give them a shout out? Sure. Um, I don't know where she is today or anything, um, but her name was Mrs. Neff, um, and she was she was great um, and really just further fueled that. And then um, just uh, basically, um, I love history, mystery type stuff. So mm -hmm. um, loved reading about you know like Amelia Earhart and just all kinds of like the weird stuff about good choice. History. Good choice. So what um, drew you to? Uh, specifically the first ladies. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, found the book, uh, cooking with the first ladies, um, or the first ladies cookbook is actually what it's called, um, at a thrift store several years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and it sat on one of my many bookshelves in my mm -hmm. house. And one day my husband just happened to see it on the shelf and he's like, Oh, that's really cool. And got it down and was looking at it. And he was like, Oh my gosh, you should cook your way through the first ladies. You should cook your way through this book and you should do it like a Julia, Julia situation. Nice. Of that yeah. nice. Good reference too. Yeah. yeah. And so really He's the one that got it started. And um, I also think it was because he was like, oh, and then we're going to eat all this food. So that'll be <laughs> fun part of it. Um, and then that's that might have been the motivation there. I think it was. I think it was. <laughs> yeah, I'm with that. I'm with um, and so from there, um, I just started and started the Instagram and put it all out there. And um I wouldn't say I wasn't ever not interested in the first ladies by any means, but that the by starting this project, it really made me way more interested in them and just how awesome literally all of those women are. Uh, no offense to men, but in comparison, when you, you know, most of the presidents had their things, you know, but all these first ladies were just like such wonderful, like human beings. It was just Awesome. Um, well, to men, this is the greatest thing I think I've ever heard. Men are the most offended people. In the world. Uh, men, you know what? You're not going to catch any arguments from this show. We understand the power of the women in our lives. And we have joked very often that despite any patriarchy and machismo things that exist, we all understand the matriarchies we actually live in very personally. I know who's the boss in this house. It's me, for the record, but it's really not. Me, it's <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So we get it. We get it. Um, and from there, it just, the project launched off and I will tell you right now that it didn't get off to a good start at all. Um, the first recipe was Martha Washington's beef steak and kidney pie. Um, I drove to a local, uh, butcher shop, um, meat store situation, um, and bought the beef kidneys. And I thought this is going to be interesting because I am not a chef. I have a bachelor's in history. I'm a decent cook, but I've never cooked things like kidneys before, and I never will again. But um, <laughs> I'm lecture, even, I give you advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, even the butcher guy was like, "Good luck with this." Damn, Damn. Wow. good luck. Um, and this literally took all day to make this pie, and followed the directions just so, and produced this beautiful pie. It, honestly, it was really a gorgeous situation for food and sat down to eat it. And it tasted exactly what you would think eating kidney would taste like from a person that's not a chef and probably didn't do it right. But no, so even hard. You, no. But that was, you did it right. I don't think I would be down with eat with the meal. Oh, you'd try it. Um, try it because I will do things, but then I think I will regret it. Is what I'm saying. Well, the regret is fair. That's part of the journey. Yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, uh, it's kidneys. Like I just, I have a hard time eating anything outside of a child's menu today. <laughs> That's also true. Mr. Yeah. 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 Mr. Nothing on his burgers. Cheese and ketchup bowl over here. That's why the next thing, the next chat we have is going to be so outside the box for me. I'm so excited. We're going to be, well, we won't tease it. We'll yeah, talk don't about tease it yet. Episode. Everybody's yep. got to wait till the end of this chat to find out the other cool thing we're going to get into with uh, Miss Morgan here. So, um, 
So how, so moving on from a, I don't want to say a failed dish because it sounds like it was successful. You made it look gorgeous. Uh, presentation is everything. I've watched That's enough. That's true. I've watched enough Food Network to know that presentation is like everything. So what do you, where do you go from there? Uh, well, one last thing about it. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I, I want to, you know, I, you know, I'm a, obviously a terrible mother because uh, I tried it. My husband tried it. We both were like, um, and we called our teenage daughter down and said, you have to try this. And we did not say what it was. And so she actually tried it too. And not a fan either, but I, you know, I, that's parenting. <laughs> I know. I mean, what can you do? But anyway, so from there, um, I just continued to cook my way through with most of the dishes being really, really good. Um, and then um, at uh, the historic site that I worked at pre pandemic um, out here in Spring Hill, which is Ripa Villa Plantation. Um, my boss at the time um, allowed me to put on a President's Day luncheon. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah, it was very cool. I just finished cooking my way all the way through, um, and we had several different seatings, actually. So it, it, it was a big money maker for the property, which was great. Um, everybody loved it. So I chose several recipes, um, and we just put on this whole thing. Awesome. And then... Of course, COVID hit um, about a month later and everything shut down. And that's when the National First Ladies Library reached out and asked if I would be interested in doing virtual content for them. So I started out doing uh, pre-recorded videos, um, of course. And then they said, what do you think? Do you feel comfortable? Would you do live programs? And I was like, but I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. That's a huge compliment. Congratulations. Yeah, it was great. And so now I do quarterly live programs, of course, for them. And I did get a chance to go with my best friend, Rebecca, uh, about a year and a half ago to Canton, Ohio, to visit them at the library, um, which was an amazing experience. And Canton, other than the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Yes. Basically, I, you know what? The goal is to teach people on this show something they didn't know every day. Mission accomplished, guys. Well done. I thank you. I did not know that. That's awesome. And the, the library um, is in Canton, um, but also um, that's where Ida McKinley, First Lady Ida McKinley, is from. Um, and okay. so right next door is the Saxton McKinley House that oh. you can also tour. Nice. Um, which was William and Ida's home. We, we're we not, I don't know how we officially stand as far as McKinley, the president, but definitely McKinley, the Civil War soldier, we're down with. I mean, under fire, delivering coffee and sandwiches. Essentially, we joke, non-jokingly, he is the first barista, and he's a barista, he's a combat barista. <laughs> you know, he's the this first Starbucks employee to bring you your latte and a sandwich under fire. Uh, and since it happens at the battlefield we love, you know, we kind of grew to like that guy. Um, that's pretty neat. Um <laughs> What was it? And I also uh, I applaud the the stepping you know outside of your comfort zone you know pushing into doing something like a live broadcast because we love the luxury of post production. Huh. I can tell yeah. you definitively, like we love it. We get away with making all the dumb mistakes that people will never see. I'm sure having done post production, you can imagine all the flubs that you don't share with your audience, right? So yes. <laughs> live, was that a was that, I was, it feels harrowing for me just to listen and think about when we do things like that are semi-live from time to time and how nervous and, oh, so what was that like for you just to settle into doing something new like that? Especially with such a large and important audience as them. Yeah, no, it was, um, especially the first one, I'm pretty, I'm pretty used to it now um, mm -hmm. after doing several, but the first one, yeah, I was not right. I just didn't know how I was going to go, but um, I think the thing that kind of freaked me out the most is the cooking demonstration parts at first and trying to figure out how to present it because the program was you have an hour. Like we don't want to go too much over an hour with mm. these programs. And so with presenting the kind of PowerPoint that I do um, and talking about whichever first lady it is and then going into the cooking it's yeah, it's that was the hardest part for me to figure out how to uh, pre measure out the ingredients and then how I was going to present it because some things obviously you can't show how to cook it in 10 minutes, you right. know, 
Um, so, so that was doing the, the, you end up doing the food thing where it's like in the oven and miraculously out of the oven. <laughs> yes, I know that's my favorite part, honestly. Of of um, so yeah, it was a huge um step out, which doing this is definitely a huge leap for me too, because I've never done anything like this before either. Oh, so really. We're, um, thank you for letting us be a part of your journey in that way. That's awesome. Yes, that's really that's cool. great. Thank you. Thank you. Um and I will be having a totally new experience because I know that y'all also presented at History Camp America, mm-hmm. um, yep, which sure of course did. was virtual, but I um, got chosen to present at History Camp Boston. Oh, um, congratulations. That's huge. In August. Yeah. So um, I'm going also with my best friend, Rebecca. I'm going to give her a shout out because she also Rebecca. listens to your podcast. Um and I'm going to do, um, that's going to be an in-person thing, um, but I'm going to do cooking with the suffragettes. Nice. Oh, that'll be cool. Very cool. I'm not yeah. allowed in Boston. You'll have to let me know what it's like. You can see the hat I'm wearing. They they definitely stop me at the border and don't let me in. Yeah. <laughs> okay with that. I'm okay with that, but definitely uh, a great city. I wish I could visit. Um, so I talk about a lot of things tonight and we have a special first lady we're going to get to but i want to talk about obviously in a, in a broader sense having decided that you're going to settle in on the first ladies and you're going to kind of settle in on the, that cooking is going to be a part of it do you have favorites in the long lineage of the the you know illustrious first uh, ladies do you have favorite meals things like that um matt and i love stories little and eating and nuggets we do love you can tell look at me ladies and gentlemen uh but I I just like to hear the things people are passionate about. And before we get into tonight's focus, I just want to hear, you know, do you have certain favorite first ladies, some stories about them, some favorite foods associated with them or. I do. Yes. Um, So when I started out doing the project, I, you know, I was like, Jackie Kennedy is my favorite first lady, which I'm sure, you know, 90% of people would be like, Jackie Kennedy is my favorite first lady. And she still is one of my top favorite first ladies. And it's not for any reason. I don't like her any less after researching her. I like her even more, to be honest. But Mm. I knew so little about so many of the other first ladies. But my favorite first lady is Grace Coolidge. Um, Really interesting choice. Yes. Um, I love her so much. Um, she was just so unique and so independent, especially in the twenties. Um, and really the thing that pushed me over the edge with her was that she had the pet raccoon, Rebecca, ironically. <laughs> Shout out Rebecca. <laughs> Shout out to another Rebecca, the raccoon. And she, you, this raccoon lived in the white house. It literally just ran around the white house. Somebody had sent the Coolidge's the raccoon as um that was going to be for their thanksgiving dinner and both she and calvin were like no no not happening so they basically he pardoned the raccoon and then they took it in as a pet that come from is that was that you mountaineer state like who says a raccoon to the white house (laughs) That I don't remember off the top of my head. I can't remember where it came from. Sounds like West Virginia. I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to point fingers right at the back. <laughs> just call them out. Yep, um, yep. I'm sure it was somewhere, you know. But um, anyway, um, so they named it Rebecca. It had a little, like, very fancy little collar with the wow. little tag on it with its name. She walked it around on a leash. I mean, she's photographed a lot in public. With Does the raccoon. raccoon ever do what raccoons do? Like, you know, eat trash and I'm sure people and give them rabies in the White House? They didn't they didn't get rabies from it by any means, but I am sure I they, I do know there's stories of it tearing up the White House for sure. For sure. It's still a wild animal. Dolly Madison is turning over in her grave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was um, just thinking it's probably a good thing Teddy was already passed by okay. that point. <laughs> Um, they actually uh, had a second raccoon brought in, and I can't remember its name. Down the raccoons in the White House? Yes, yes, because it needed a friend. But of then it did, I mean, the logic tracks. It did get too wild and out of control, and so ultimately they donated them to the National Zoo. Ah. Honestly, the, the history of our country makes a lot more sense to me now. <laughs> you know, not one, but two raccoons had free run of the White House for a while. Yeah. Things, track, things track a lot more now. Um, yeah. So so okay. So she had a awesome raccoon. She and and the raccoon had a friend. Rebecca the raccoon. Shout out had a friend, uh, and she was a uh, a fiercely independent woman at a time when that was 
coming very powerfully onto the societal stage. And obviously we're in the middle of what's the word I'm looking for? Roaring. Roaring twenties, but the booze, the booze. Oh, booze. prohibition. Pro- prohibition. Yeah. Right. So, um, so what about her other than her sweet raccoon and her personality and, and I don't want to say personality. What's the word? I don't know. Mm-hmm. We're going to go with that. Don't fans here. Um, she was just, uh, I mean, just a very genuine person in regards to personality and her own person. And Calvin honestly was a terrible man to her. I mean, he mm. was, he was not good and she put up with it, but she, you know, was involved with, you know, Girl Scouts and all the different things. But, um, Really, mostly just off the top of my head, it's the raccoon, which I know is silly. But that's okay. <laughs> okay, if you were like full raccoon, full stop, end of story, I'd be like, yeah. "That's <laughs> fair." So you want um, that? And also, the 1920s, just in general, are one of my favorite time periods to uh, read or learn about. My next um, program for the National First Ladies at the end of July is going to be Florence Harding. Okay. Ah. And um, and then it's Florence Harding and. And all that jazz. Oh, so um, nice. I think that'll be a really fun one. But of course, Florence was kind of in that time period. Um, is that something people are going to be able to see after the fact? Because by the time this is airing, it is super cold in our area. It is December. And obviously, your program went amazing. Great job, Sarah. <laughs> We're really proud of you. Um, is that something they can go back and watch? Uh, yeah. Actually, all of my videos and live programs are on the National First Ladies Library YouTube page. Perfect. Fantastic. For our listeners out there, uh, we will include that information in the show notes. Go back and watch the program. If you haven't naturally already figured out that you should be following Sarah's account. I'm going to stump for you all night long. Okay. People are going to. Um, so, so, all right. So raccoon, um, Calvin Coolidge is a turd. I know nothing about his presidency. Like I was trying to think as soon as you brought up Mrs. Coolidge, I was like, what do I know about Calvin? I know his name. And I wish I could enlighten you more, but I don't have like a bunch of that just off the top of my we head. I also of- don't have time for turds on our show. No, <laughs> not a good don't. Name. This is cool. Moving on from Calvin. Um, all right. So and another favorite is Betty Ford. Okay. Ah. Any raccoons in Betty Ford's story? No, she didn't have raccoons, but, um, you know, she really literally saved you know, thousands, probably millions of women's lives because she was so open about her breast cancer Mm -hmm. um, leading to this like breast cancer boom of people feeling like they could go out and get these mammograms and things. And then, um, you know, she, I mean, obviously was open about her addiction and and different things and has helped people that way. But also um, she was a dancer, a professional dancer. And there's that really famous photograph of her where she jumped up on the cabinet table in the White House and oh, yeah. posed for a picture. And supposedly Gerald just about fell off his seat when he saw that. that well, photo. Gerald <laughs> fell a lot, from what I understand, <laughs> during his time in the office. Did you know he's our only park ranger president? I did not, but yep. shout out. <laughs> We're down with that. A couple of rangers here. He's also the only uh, vice president as well as president who's like never like elected to office. Yes, that's right. He, and from Michigan. He became vice president and then president all within a year through assassination. No, no. through what was it? Resignation and what else? Uh, what was they were both. It was Spiro Agnew. Oh, Spiro yeah. Spiro Agnew. Mm-hmm. I forgot he resigned ahead of Nixon. Da, 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 da. That is, I always forget that little tidbit, and that is so wild. Um, mm-hmm. Is he an effective president? I should study the presidents more. I think mm-hmm. that'll be the theme tonight is I'm going to be embarrassed for how little I know about previous administrations that aren't Wilson, Lincoln, Washington. Gerald Roosevelt. Ford is, is usually seen as a placeholder okay. uh, president. Um, he preserved I, the institution. And, yeah, and kept it going for the the rest of the uh, Nixon administration. All right. Yeah. Or well, good job. what yeah. was left of it. Good job, Gerald. Yeah. That's why Betty was like way more influential than he ever was right. in all across the board. Like literally everything she did was great. More important. That. <laughs> yeah. right, so Calvin, Burr, Gerald, great job. Burr, Burr, Burr. <laughs> uh, but you know, I but I like the I like the fact that the like the theme with the focus of tonight, you know, the 
the power behind the throne, so mm-hmm. to speak. And I don't know that she was necessarily behind the throne, but definitely aware no. of her influence and and used it well. And that's yeah. that's. It. I was thinking. I was like, what did that remind me of with the inspiration for, for millions of women to go and start uh, having um, preventative screenings and things done was um, similar, but not directly the same, but it was Barbara Bush with the AIDS, I believe, when uh, like her and Princess Diana both had the like hugging people with AIDS and like basically helping to bring the awareness and stigmas and, and things down. So uh, I didn't realize, um, obviously, because it doesn't directly affect me outside of my wife and uh and future daughters but i don't think about betty ford's in, impact like that so that's another thing i learned tonight that is awesome yeah. Dude, you're yeah. rocking it tonight sarah thank you <laughs> i'm so glad <laughs> more than matt matt's supposed to be the guy that teaches me more than anybody <laughs> well i i don't probably know a lot of the things that y'all know about different sure. historical sure. things but <laughs> Matt and I know how to move armies around that just kill each other. After a while, it gets pretty boring. <laughs> so pumped for this, and that's why I'm so pumped for what we're going to do, because uh, it's it's new, it's exciting, and it's also something that I think is really neat, and we all and different. I think, I think we all agree that people come together over food, and I think that's one of the things I'm most excited about, is we're going to link all of this to well, filling up our tummies, you know? It's just, <laughs> just good, nummy, nummy food. Um, all right, yes. so we've got... We've got um, the Coolidge's. We've got the Fords. Uh, who else are we rolling along with next? Um, those are really my, like, after re- doing so many, and especially the ones that I've done for live programs, those are probably my top two. And then after that, it just it's just, of course, Jackie Kennedy. I mean, because right. she was just, I mean, she was just an all-around amazing person in general, but, I mean, she was just so stylish and, you know, that whole thing. But... What did you do for Jackie Kennedy when it came time for her segment? Um, I did her, well, for one of my favorite recipes um, is her beef stroganoff. Oh, Um, I love beef stroganoff. Yummy, yummy. It was really good. And that was just a popular one, like, within my husband and my daughter and I, like, that was, I've cooked this and now, hey, like make that one again, you know? Nice. Um, I also for her have made like a kind of almost a charcuterie board type thing, hmm. uh, a crudite platter, I think is oh. what I called it. Um, and it's just basically vegetables on a tray. <laughs> nice. Um, and then I also for them made a Boston cream pie. Woo. Very nice. Um, um, all right, so let me ask you this. Have you made it through all of the first ladies up through our current administration? I've not done uh, Jill Biden. I haven't okay. done right. her yet. And I, all right, some question. Is there plans for that in the immediate future or something we're going to wait to figure out until we have more, I guess, available as to how to put a program together like that? Um, so she definitely won't be a live program by any means anytime soon, but... Um, I think when I looked her up, she has a chicken Parmesan recipe, but there's just so much that's still, um, you know, she's obviously still first lady. So, you know, I don't know. I haven't really decided if I'm going to wait until she's not a first lady anymore so that then it's sort of like I can kind of, this is it, you know, or um, do I go ahead and cook for her? So I haven't really decided, but All I have right, so, so knowing that you've done at least through 45, let's talk about number 16 for a second, since we are civil war <laughs> people. Let's talk about Mary Todd. What did you cook for Mary Todd Lincoln? Oh, what did I cook for Mary Todd Lincoln? And was it as uh, fun as she was? And was it as what? As fun as she was. Oh. A really um, interesting word choice. Yes. Shoot. Um, let me so look. On the spot. We can come back to it. I just, you are. Come back to that. I'm curious <laughs> because obviously Mary Todd, I think, is both deservingly painted the way she is and undeservingly painted the way she is. And I, when I say fun, I mean that both ironically and both seriously. She is a kind of fun character and person to read about when she is in her lucid moments and in her uh, grieving moments. Because I don't want to say crazy because she's basically in it. The deep throes of grief yes. for a lot of her erratic behavior. So, but in either bucket you want to put her in, she her character uh, personality is 
big, you know, she obviously is the, the focus of the South a lot as mm-hmm. far as their ire and propaganda and things like that. So well, and the Northern papers actually. So, you know, they're also taking shots at her and for spending the money in the white house and right. everything and, and all that. But I, she is somebody that I'm fascinated by both in the, the deep and the shallow sense. I do enjoy the cheeky humor associated with her, but I do think that Mary Todd Lincoln is dramatically mischaracterized especially when it comes to certain behaviors because again grief yeah i mean like we can't say it deep enough that like they come to the white house i think having already buried a child they bury another one in the white house yep um then they bury lincoln she also watched her husband age a thousand years in the four years of his first term um and then she watched him die jesus and wasn't allowed in the room when he did pass the room, like again, not to offend men, right? Wink. Like that's why I love that comment because men kept her away from her husband. Like this is terrible. I, I give Mary Todd a lot more of a, a pass, I guess, than than maybe people are doing this because I I think I felt grief that was pretty powerful, and I I kind of get that. So um, while I was vamping a bit, I think I'm pretty good at that. Hmm. I was a pretty good vamp. Did we? Did you find the answer? What you cooked? I did. I oh. cooked um, white chicken fricasseed, which oh. uh, fricasseed is, uh, is that? <laughs> where the meat is uh, stewed in its own juices and served in white sauce. So that sounds pretty good, actually. Like, a, like an Alfredo white sauce or like a holiday? Uh, one? Like almost like a gravy okay. is, what, is what I think that I. Like a chicken gravy. Yeah, like a chicken Juicy. So what kind of meat is it? Chicken? Chicken. This is a, a chicken. chicken. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And um well, this I is think it had, like some vegetables it. in it. So this is McGuire would love it. We eat chicken all the damn time. So people don't play the game. And I also cooked election cake because oh. there was an election cake associated with them. And I wanna say that it's it was election cake because I mean they made it and it was but it was super simple to make with simple ingredients. I think I'm not hmm. sure, but I know I made an election cake because first they have term, second term. Was it for Lincoln's first term or his second term? Do you know? I don't. I'm sorry. I feel like that's a first term vibe. I feel like the cake would definitely be like probably. You don't know who I am. Vote for me. I gave you a cake. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that shows you how little I know about the political uh, way of doing things in the 1860s. I just assume they bribe people with whiskey and cakes. That's not far off the no, mark. No. Vote Probably early. not. Probably not. Vote early and vote often. Hmm. Um, all right. Well, we should do in the future. Uh, maybe we can have a chat behind the scenes and see if maybe we can do a focus on Mary Todd. Since, you know, I do feel the way I do about her. And, and I think a lot of people out there do and are starting to kind of open their minds and hearts to the fact that history is, uh, you know, deeply misunderstood. Deeply misunderstood. Woman. So, people who have all the same feelings that we have uh, and we seem to have forgotten that along the way so maybe maybe if you're down we'll talk about it we'll get you back to talk about mary todd that'd be great i'm totally down so yep so, all right so if we are ready are we ready are we ready to talk about our girl tonight the first Peter Nelson. <laughs> the first real president the first female president sorry yeah. of the united states i know that we still have an officially elected what we should have already elected, but at this point, let's be real, Edith Wilson ran this country and probably signed off on some very big things that we ended up doing as the United States. So shout out to the first female president of our country, Edith Wilson. So um, we know why we picked Edith Wilson, because she's the the wife of the first World War president, and we are World War One geeks. Um, what about Edith Wilson do you like? What do you know? About- what, what kind of person is she? Um... <clears throat> uh, she was a really strong woman. And again, this is also for her time period too. Um, and uh, she was kind of seen as this really strong woman who literally was, you know, not only basically our first female president, but she kind of could hide that enough and didn't come off as not feminine. So she was still kind of, you know, uh, able to have that Victorian ideal of what a woman should be sort of the way that she came across. Um, even though she had this really strong personality. So she had that scary British grace, even though she's not <laughs> British, but you know, like whenever you see a portrait on film that they're like dignified, 
but super powerful and commanding in everything they do. Those yeah. are the vibes I'm getting. Yeah. I'm into this. I'm already in. Let's go. Sarah, with your research, did you read much or look into much on their courtship uh, between Woodrow and her? Uh, because um, from what I understand, that was a very interesting um, period as well. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was, well, so he had been married for, he had been married before to right. Ellen Wilson, who was first lady for a time, uh, until she passed away of, uh, of, uh, Bright's disease, which mm -hmm. is like a kidney situation. Yeah, an um, and, uh, they had three children together. Um, Edith would not go on to have any children with him, but uh, she passed away and um, his like political advisors and whatnot were really concerned when he met Edith. Uh, well, her last name at the time was Galt because she had also been married before and he had passed away um, that the public would think that this was a terrible situation, that he was dating and getting married, et cetera, so soon after his wife's passing. Uh, but it actually turned out to be the opposite. But they met um, through Woodrow Wilson's cousin, mm -hmm. uh, Helen Bones, um, and their mm -hmm. mutual Brady, friend. Brady friend. That, Sorry? That is, I said, great. Is that Billy Bones? It's like great, great granddaughter? <laughs> sure, sure. Let's Fun say it is. Treasure Island, folks. Jesus. Um, and also uh, through their mutual friend, um, Altrude Gordon. Um, and Miss Gordon actually went on, <clears throat> excuse me, to marry Carrie Grayson, who turned out to be the physician who treated Woodrow after his big infamous stroke mm. and kind of, um, would go on then to help Edith kind of make that whole story to the American public that nothing was wrong with him. But anyway, so they met um, and she was at the time just very wealthy. Her husband had passed. Uh, he owned a really high-end jewelry store in Washington, D.C., which was left to her. And then she took over the store, running the store. And uh, she was visiting. Uh, in March of 1915, they got introduced. This was only about seven months after his wife's death. And they just hit it off. Um, she actually didn't really know that he was the president of the United States. Yeah, and, so and, not impressed. And Woodrow was over the moon for her pretty darn quickly, too. So this is what the First World War. He's like, guys, I'm in love. I need, I'm trying to turn to woo her, fight your war. I'm busy. Historical yeah. fact, look it up. Didn't he actually um, propose a couple of times before she finally accepted? Or am I keeping the gun? He, he did, I think, with her. Now, the thing about proposals that I know about is with him and Ellen, because he proposed to Ellen, and she came back and said, you know, um, yeah, maybe, but I want to go to art school. So she went to art school for a year, and then they got married. So I think probably I think he did come at Edith a couple times because she wasn't, I think, really sure if she wanted to be married again, from what I understand, from what I've looked at, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, but um, they got married on December 18th of 1915. Mm -hmm. And it was right before that 1916 election. And they were just really concerned that the American public would be really upset or whatever. Oh, and, I don't know. What's the time we're talking between the the relationships? Yeah, because I actually don't think I either heard it or wasn't mentioned, but how long between Ellen's passing and Edith's marriage? Um I think it was it was less than a year. Oh, I'm gonna say yeah. that because I don't want to say it long. Less than a year. Oh. And then um they only uh Edith and Woodrow only dated for uh I want to say five months, but uh, but some were less than even half a year that they dated. Then they were engaged in October, and they got married in December. Hmm. Um, so real fast yeah. turn around I mean, there. I yeah, when you know, you know, you just rock and roll. You just go for it. But yep. <laughs> uh, it, it turned out, you know, that the public loved her, the press loved her. Uh, you know. Everybody loved her, so it all worked out, so it didn't affect him in a negative way um, at all. Um, and um, their first date 
uh, Edith and Madrid was to a baseball game. He was a huge baseball fan. Nice. Yes, I do know this because I'm a big baseball guy. So the connection is obviously something I focus on a lot. Um, and that was her first public date. I'm so sorry. He was just going over to her house. Mm-hmm. Oh, like uh, at what time of the night, by any chance? Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know. My, my, Mr. President. Uh, <laughs> I doubt it. Kennedys were like, I am taking notes right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I used to actually know this myself. Do you remember? Do you know what the, the game they went to see? Do you like, do you know? I don't. I don't. A, if, I think if I recall correctly, it was a rather eventful baseball game. Um, stat nerds out there, look it up, get to me if I don't get to it first. But I, I'm pretty sure that the game they went to was one of the more, I guess, historic dead air ball kind of baseball games. So maybe something to come back to there. This is why we pull the threads, we jump in the rabbit holes and all sorts of fun stuff happens here. So um, baseball is everything, by the way. Don't think he's. Yeah. Glad that I said that. Well, tough. <laughs> this is what I do. And so anyway, um, yeah, they uh, were, you know, real fast courtship, real fast turnaround. Um, and then from there, I mean, she just basically um, received just unprecedented access to him and the presidency and was just in on it almost immediately. Um, which in comparison um, to Ellen and her role, they saw Ellen as being very involved, but not like Edith was. Um, Ellen was extremely horrified by the homeless problem that she saw. She was really excited when the Tariff Act got passed because she thought that was a really good thing and kind of celebrated that. But then she didn't really have anything to do with it. She didn't like try to convince him one way or another or give any sort of opinion where Edith kind of voiced an opinion, but to be completely honest, probably shouldn't have Hmm. really voiced her opinion um, where Ellen kind of had a little bit more of an understanding of it all. Um, I guess Ellen understood and probably fell more into the traditional societal norms of being a woman in the early 20th century and, you know, in the, what is it? It's not the Gilded Age, is it? It's a little bit after, yeah. The hangover, but, you know. So, yeah. So, yeah. But, um, you know, from there, I mean, Edith was in it hard. <laughs> um, she uh, was reading really important documents and classified situations and real confidential or what we're supposed to be. Okay. And um, a lot of it related to World War I. Um, she literally was granted access to uh, not only these confidential files, but also his little private office drawer because he worked out of a private office in the family residence for the most part, most of the time. And um, she was just by his side the whole time. And at one point she was actually uh, given like sec- a secret access code in relation to the war. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Um, even when he worked in the Oval Office, she was like in there, she was like quietly listening. Um, and this was listening in on meetings with like really important politicians and foreign dignitaries and all sorts of things. So she knew all of the things that were going on and it just her access and her um, piece of it was just like totally unparalleled in our country's history. It sounds um, like on the job training for what's about to happen. Yeah, basically, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so then he is, uh, Woodrow is advocating really hard for the League of Nations Mm -hmm. and is traveling the country trying to like kind of get people on board and he got really sick um kind of out of exhaustion that sort of thing the doctor um that we were talking about a little earlier he comes in and he's like he's had a stroke um and him and Edith kind of she conspires with him but influences Mm -hmm. the physician of the White House to say to the American public that everything's fine. He just is exhausted. He's going to be fine. When in fact, he was like paralyzed on his left left side at the time from the stroke and was in bed. And so from there, um, that was in uh, October of 1919, um, Edith just took over. She took over Hmm. everything. She 
um, determined who could visit him. Um, and as time went on, they started to speculate, the, the American public as well as other politicians and members of his cabinet, um, that he was not running the country and that Edith actually was. Um, her handwriting is on lots of documents. Um, so wow. he would get like a telegram or something and she, you would then you can see in the documentation, it's her handwriting at the bottom. So even now today, looking back on it, you know, most people are like historian people are like, well, did she even ask him? Did she even go to him with this telegram or did she just, you know, write down whatever she was going to write down. Um, members of the Senate uh, referred to uh, her and signing her own name to state documents on occasion, like her own name, wow. not even faking his name. That's bold. Um, it is bold. <laughs> I mean, she really went for it on this. Um, I'm down. I'm not going to lie. There isn't a single part of me that's like, no, you shouldn't have done this. I'm like, do it. Uh, yeah. Thing. Well, weren't they very concerned about the vice president taking over? And that's why she was really spearheading this? Yes, they they were. And they, of course, made the decision that he didn't need to. Um, but uh, they they called it a petticoat government. Um, sometimes they call this whole time period Mrs. Wilson's regency. Um, nice. You know, They've said she's our first female president, and she basically was. And um, one of my favorite, do, do y'all watch Drunk History? Yes. <laughs> yes. Have you seen Edith Wilson's episode? I have not, to be very honest. Uh, well, it's no. a must. It's a must watch, especially after this whole conversation today. Um, but uh, in it, um, in this episode, and I think it's kind of like, kind of a perfect quote about the whole situation was, is they say on the episode, nothing bad happened and nothing good happened. So really nothing really happened. Like, you know, nothing, it wasn't a catastrophic experience, but also it wasn't really that great either because nothing really happened. Um, That's good considering that the president is basically vegetabling or doing his best sitting on the couch potato impression right now. So the fact yes. that just wrapped up a world war and kind of kept things status quo. Yeah, big deal. <laughs> You know, kind of baseline situation. That's a really good thing. Like, great job, Edith. I mean, pretty much. I mean, especially since, you know, what, you know, a lot of people thought, you know, looking back on her and in that comparison to Ellen, that uh, she just didn't really have what it would take to make any sorts of these decisions if she was and not referring to him. But so she didn't, she didn't destroy the country, obviously. Um, and, you know, just kind of kept it going. But on one occasion, which I think is one of the craziest stories, is uh, the, a Republican senator um, whose name was uh, uh, Albert Fall. Um, and I thought you were going to say Mitch McConnell. And I was going to be like, no! <laughs> oh! Well, I don't, he wasn't a Republican senator back then. But Albert Fall, um, oh. he is they're all questioning all of this. Like, where's the president? How is the president? It's been like five months now sort of thing. So he actually goes to visit with Wilson and they kind of all freak out about it in a way. And they take Woodrow and they prop him up basically on the pillow. Cause he can't just sit up and whatever. So they kind of prop him up and then they kind of like put, like something like either a pillow or some blankets. So, cause his left side was paralyzed and kind of like propped him up and Albert Fall comes in and they completely continue to convince them that Woodrow is fine and he is doing the job and is going to make a full recovery. I kid you not, when this story started, I, like, I hope this goes weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> I'm starting to turn the corner into weekend at Bernie's. And I am thrilled that we just did that. And that is that is a real part of our, our history. Um, what a ridiculous scene, by the way. I, I we were talking about it. I, for, I forgot to ask, had the president not made any public appearances of any sort to kind of keep up this through five months? Let's think about that in the modern sense. We like, can't go five minutes without hearing the <laughs> White House. With the president or the former president, any of them at this point, you cannot duck it for five seconds. Five months? 
the sitting president disappearing for five months would be un- obscene. It, w- it would be historically, I don't know, be catastrophic almost in a way here. So that's incredible. And then what chicanery happening in the White House? I feel like this Scooby-Doo scene, people running across the building. <laughs> the- yeah, probably, <laughs> but that's, I, and, it, and it was, I mean, it's such a different time period. That's such a great point because it just was such a different time period because, yeah, we could not do that today. He also could not have been, you know, just casually going over to Edith's house dating and hanging out. Like our president could not do that today without people being like outside and take, you know, cause it was kind of, they kept it pretty much under wraps for a really long time until that public baseball game. But yeah, no, I, I mean, I don't understand. People just took it all at her word basically. And then Albert Falls word who, and he, he said, Oh, well, he had a very firm handshake and he was able to converse. So he, I don't know if he didn't notice that some of it he wasn't like working, wanting, but he bought it on some level. That I, I'm pretty sure that that is the final kind of instance uh, where uh, that's when they kind of made that decision that they weren't going to have to replace him with the vice president. And this also, unreal. Um, at the time, uh, there was nothing in the Constitution. Um, I read that. What What do you do if the president of the United States is? Is this pre Twenty Fifth Amendment? Uh, yes, by quite a bit. What is yeah. that? I don't so, think it comes around and. Oh, do you know, Sarah, off the top of your head? I don't. I'm sorry. I just know that it wasn't there. Um, so there was nothing. Nobody knew what to do. Even if he was not coming back, it wasn't this automatic situation like it would be now today. Um, in that situation, so. That's pretty wild. I'm I'm just I'm completely mystified by the fact that we went five months in this country with them. <laughs> See the president? Yeah, don't worry about it. it. President, I feel like it's been like a couple months, and they're like the war is raging, and like no, it was after after the war. It was it was in 1919. Sorry, sorry. The war, well, we have other conflict happening in Russia. Like the world war isn't happening, but we have American GIs fighting in the. The crap storm that is the Russian Revolution and the post-Russian Revolution. So, oh, the Russian Civil War, yeah, yes. Civil War, I guess the right term for it. So he, you know, he's not not dealing with military action and significant things happening and and geopolitical stuff. It's just wild that in that environment, it's like, yeah. Um, it was also the the perfect not moment, if you will, but the the slot of time for him to actually have had this stroke because he's already gone overseas for the Treaty of Versailles. He's already he's met, all the public he's met all the public appearances. He's done the big um, discussions about the League of Nations. He's basically got it set up. Of course, it's not going to be passed by Congress, um, but he's made that push. So, all the big things we know for the kind of end of the Wilson administration have already occurred. And then he has this stroke in, you said October of 19, right? Yes. Yep. Wow. That is wild. Yeah. And so I he's, know. Only, he's only got to last a year at that point, less than a, a little less or a little more than a year. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. 20. He was in office until 21. Oh, till 21. Excuse me. For some reason, I thought he was out in 20. No. Um, 21. Um, but be, and also, well, that's right, March of 21. Yeah. Um, well, because I mean, he's, he signed in the, the 19th amendment happened in 1920, giving women the right to vote, which was interesting. And I Edith kind of, it. did Edith really sign that one and make it happen? Oh no, Edith would not have signed that one. Not at all. She was extremely anti-women suffrage. Oh, and now that's interesting. I know. And I couldn't find a ton about it, um, to be honest, because, well, again, that's one of my big things and I'm doing the suffragette thing, but I couldn't find a lot about why exactly. Um, but some of it did have to do with uh, when they were protesting outside the White House um, several years earlier. And she just thought that that was just gross and thought it was very rude of these women to be protesting outside of the White House and that sort of thing. Um, Shame on them for fighting for their rights. Hmm. I know, and your rights, but I guess she was already at that point, you know, like, well, I've already been president, so I don't need to vote. I don't know. (laughs) I don't want them to vote for me. They might not vote for me. I don't know what her thoughts were, but she called them um, the devils in the workhouse. 
I, I wow. If this was WWF, that was where <laughs> the heel turned. I mean, she kind of turns bad guy right there. I mean, that's kind of wild that a little bit. I don't want to be that on the nose, but it, it would shock me that a woman of such influence and such independence would not vote for the beginning of the equality process for women in this country. Like what? I know. I, know. Uh, I was kind of blown away by that too, honestly. Um, but yeah, no, uh, that was all Woodrow on that one. She, she was thank you for the, the thank you for the correction on that too, sir. I, I didn't, um, I guess I did not remember that that was Wilson's presidency that the 19th passes in. I kid you not, that would be like me if I was a senator and they'd be like, Pat, we're going to disclose if UFOs exist or not. Or if people are from, <laughs> do you want to know? And everybody that knows everything about me, look at my shirt, would be if, if I was like, you know what? No. Yes. <laughs> keep that one, keep that one quiet, guys. Yeah. Like, keep what? that to yourself. What? <laughs> I'm going to throw this out here about knowing that it was 1921 because. Uh, up until just sitting here getting ready to have this uh, conversation with y'all, I'm still reading about these people. Nothing wrong with people. that. <laughs> you know, I mean, but just that's just the way that it that I like. I mean, I will do like you know, I'm just like real into it, and yeah. so that was kind of fresh in my mind about when her, her time period as first lady. But also, the research is the part, fun but, part. Yeah, that's the research is the fun part. Yeah, you made a comment at the beginning about some people don't like that, and I was like, whoo. That does what we do does not like the research. I yeah. mean, I, it's like your own little adventure. I, like we talk about this at work. Like my boss loves when I get excited about something because it's new to me. It might not be new to him, but it's new to me. I made a discovery. It's very exciting. I'm on a journey. So researching is great. Um, and because Matt and I exist all over the centuries of time and space historically right now, like we are, <laughs> I, I give you a pass, buddy, for not remembering when that gets, I can't keep seven days and, and, uh, and seven, pines. seven pines straight, you know, stuff I can't even think right now, <laughs> but like, no, I, it's, a I thing, mean, whatever. it's sorry. impossible to remember all of it. It's crazy. Um, but, oh, but uh, also she was, um, also involved, and I don't remember the organization's name now, but it was a organization that was very pro the Confederacy and advocating for oh. that the UDC. South lost. Yeah, is the United UDC. Yeah, United Daughters of the Confederacy. That's it. Yeah, so she was real involved with that too. Um, well, so was Woodrow. Uh, he he was big. He was big onto the lost cause. Unfortunately, yeah, yeah, they both were, and they think that's mostly their southern upbringing because you know she grew up in West Virginia. Um, can I can I appeal to the people of Stanton, Virginia, for a minute? Can you get rid of the you? Get rid of the jackasses at this point. Call it Stanton or drop the you. <laughs> it on the map it's it's staunton and if you say that they're like uh, uh, yeah, it's staunton. we just lost our shenandoah valley listeners you know what i'm coming in the valley and now i'm coming in just like sheridan just like hunter Ooh, get ready we I, really I, lost i'm coming in the valley wesley Barrett. just i'm dropping names i'm dropping fire that's right i'm sorry i'm calm listeners i'm not gonna mm -hmm. actually come into your breadbasket but jesus christ calm down people <laughs> Yeah, so I like to have I like to have fun, especially at the lost cause expense. I don't uh, I don't make any bones about that. It is a terrible thing that has affected our nation uh, for a very very long time. Continues to do so, and I will fight the good fight. Time to cut it out. Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean you can't change it. You can't change history. It happened. Move on. <laughs> like, I don't know. So, or not so, move on, but learn with, from it. And just, what's wrong you can't. with Edith? Being in this very interesting position where he is, I don't want to keep saying he's a vegetable because I don't know. Is he in that condition for the rest of his life? Like, does he ever recover any sort of cognitive ability after the stroke? Cognitive, yes, but he's he's mm -hmm. going to be stroked out on his left side, I think, for the rest of his life. Yeah. Like, he's still able to conduct the presidency to some degree, right? Yeah, but he just never fully recovered. Now, he recovered... I mean, it, obviously, there's going to be continuous decline up until his death. But when they moved out of the White House and into um, their home, which was on S Street in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. um, she tried to decorate and create the home to be as close to the White House 
uh, and their family residents in the White House as possible so that he felt more comfortable. So they went as far as to replicate the Lincoln uh, bed um, hmm. for his bedroom. That was the bed that he slept in at the White House. So she really tried to make that really comfortable for him. So, yeah, he never fully... Yeah, that suggests some cognitive deterioration. Yeah. I didn't really yeah. That. So, so Edith was obviously front and center for all this, highly aware. It makes a lot more sense why she kind of kept a command and control situation. And I, I, I feel like what I betrayed myself as a as a preacher of people being people. I it sounds like they really did love each other. They kind of knew right out of the bay, uh, right out of the gate, what they meant to each other. Quick dating, quick proposal, quick marriage. So I also know how fiercely defensive you can get when you feel a bit that way about somebody. So, you know, when she sees her husband in this condition, command and control might not be the way we've also kind of framed it, where it's like this power grab. And if that's kind of how it came off for you, I'm not, I'm sorry, not the listener, but I definitely want to, you know, humanize it. She's also, you know, a spouse. Defending her spouse. You know. Her spouse. Yeah. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because in the, in the non-political world, there are vultures everywhere. Her husband is, by the way, the president of the United States at the moment that it's becoming one of the most powerful, like the superpower that we're about to become. It's the dawn of it. The right dawn now. of the American century. Yeah. And she's there at the front of it. And I, you know, I, I think that should be said that there's a, a fair amount of protecting happening. Mm -hmm. And I probably didn't do my best to illustrate that earlier. Hmm. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. And I really didn't either. It really was her primary concern was his health. That's and not mean. politics. Um, but yeah, it was really she was just good at them. She was just good at the politics. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Most definitely. <laughs> I'm good at that. Um, but, um, uh, let's uh let's do this. Do you have anything else that you want to add to the discussion tonight about Edith? Anything about her? Oh, let's talk about her food. Like, what okay. is the type of food that she cooked? Um, any specific state dinners she was a part of, any meals that she made for Woodrow privately, anything for herself? Just where is she on the queue? And is she a good, is she a good cook or is she like me? Is she just nubs in the kitchen? <laughs> uh, there's not much about her being a cook or not being a cook. Um, she also did not host a lot of the traditional uh, dinners and different events um, hmm. during her time as first lady, uh, because for the most part, uh, she was first lady during either like wartime or during one of the pres of his, or during that presidential campaign of his, um, and then also during his you know illness, obviously. Mm -hmm. So she did not entertain quite as much as a lot of the other first ladies. But um, you know, even before, so Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, in World War II, developed seven and a half cent meals, and okay. you know they were designed to help. Uh, make your rations last longer. Um, and they, they of course were very affordable for, um, most Americans. Uh, that was stuff like deviled eggs and, uh, you know, very yeah. simple, very plain Love dishes. Yeah, um, the devil and tell him, thank you for those, by the way. And an, <laughs> yeah, another, for and another amazing first lady too, Eleanor Roosevelt. She is, but, uh, oh. The devil, thank you for metal and devil <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, but I won't go too far here. But Edith <laughs> Wilson was kind of this big precursor uh, to what uh, Eleanor started to do in World War II uh, during World War I. Um, she put a big focus on rations. Um, and uh, she instituted meatless Mondays. Um, and encourage yeah. victory yeah. gardens. So mm -hmm. even victory gardens, when I think about victory gardens prior to reading into Ellen Wilson kind of this much, but I think of Eleanor Roosevelt, but Edith had them uh, before her. Um, and uh, they really kind of strove, the Wilsons did, to be an example for the American people um, to help the war effort. Um, and uh, Edith, in fact, entertained the troops. She organized some entertainment for them with celebrities like Charlie Chaplin. Uh, oh, but yeah. the whole Wilson family showed support in basically every way they possibly could. Um, their daughter, Margaret, sang to make money. Um, 
they also had wheatless Mondays and meatless Tuesdays as well. I'm and... not down with this meatless thing. Like, what are you doing <laughs> here? How, what do you do? Just drink water? Do you bite a potato? Like, what do you, what do, you do when we say? Yeah, you're well, gonna... not that bad. Vegetables. was racist. My <laughs> made a humorous joke at me. And my producer is with me behind the scenes. As soon as you said meatless Monday, he... He was an offended man on the other side. He was like, "What?" And I also was because I love red meat, and I uh, and I'm just I'm shocked. Meatless Mondays, meatless Tuesdays. We're just making this up as we go, Edith. Come on now. And Eleanor, though and Eleanor, Eleanor had all of these things in, in you know effect during her time as well. But um, Edith also um, had sheep. Uh, on the White House lawn that they raised. Right. And, Not as raised um, as raccoon, though. Shout out to Rebecca again. Your friend. I know. I know. Uh, the sheep were not as fun. Um, they were raised. Um, they sold their wool um, to uh, benefit the Red Cross. Uh, and the sheep also grazed on the White House lawn, helping to cut costs of like mowing the grass. I was so, going to I was going to ask you about that, Sarah, if uh, if they were a meat breed or a wool breed. I raised sheep for a number of years and they are dumb. Uh, they're <laughs> not a smart animal. I need to time out this entire show right now. What did you just say? Oh, yeah. You I learned something new about you every day. What? You raised sheep? Yeah, for like 15 years, dude. Huh? Dude, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Host Matt McGuire, joined by Shepherd Matt Borders. Uh, uh, uh. this literally over. I don't know about that. Um, dude, I'm honestly I'm I'm shocked right now. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us for this moment. Uh, I got I... surprised by everything in the house. I am not. I didn't know that we had a sheep uh, herder with us, brother. We got lots to talk about tonight. Sorry to send him off the rails like that, Sarah. That is okay. I'm good with it. I think that's pretty interesting. I'm so glad I brought up the White House sheep. What's happened here? You may have never known. What's have to do it? Dive right back to the sheep that aren't mats. <laughs> yeah, right. But these are grazing sheep and wool and wheat. And what were they, Matt? A wool breed. Dr. Borders, these are wool sheep. Um, not, that, that would be my parents. not meat sheep. Um, Meat sheep, by the way, has now entered the lexicon of the podcast. Meat sheep is now a thing. Um, yeah, meat sheep. I don't know about that. That's <laughs> so politically convenient, you know, for the Red Cross visual, but also to keep your grass cut nice because we know the White House grounds got to look like a uh, the 18th hole at Augusta. It's got to look nice. Um, any other? Any other? Um, yeah. Uh, so also during this. During the Wilson administration, um, he established the U.S. Food Administration, and oh, nice. That, uh, he appointed Herbert Hoover to run that. Hmm. Um, hey, and we'll, point, we'll see him again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the whole point of it was to influence Americans to eat less and to grow more, and they called it Hooverizing. So um, they encouraged these substitutions, uh, like. Wait, well, and you're going to love this because yes. we're going against the meat thing again. But they were going they were telling you to take soybeans mm -hmm. and substitute that mm -hmm. nope. for the meat. I'm out. So no meat, soybeans. I'm out. Well, that's um, that's really interesting, though, because we hear all about soy and its uses in the modern sense. But I never would have thought it was dating all the way back to the early 20th century as, a, as an alternative for meat. That is really interesting. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, uh, they had uh, victory bread um, and they were uh, trying to get you to do that because uh, it would save the flour, wheat flour specifically. Um, and they, of course, wanted to do all this so they could, you know, help those doughboys dough over there fighting mm -hmm. because mo most of the time they were eating uh, rice flour cakes um, that they baked on campfires. And um, that can kind of be compared, you know, to uh, Valley Forge yeah, uh, during the Revolutionary action. War yep. with yeah. the fire cakes. So, um, but with Edith Wilson, um, when I originally cooked for her, um, she kind of, it was almost like a Thanksgiving situation. Mm. It okay. was a roasted turkey um, and then old Virginia stuffed, um, old Virginia corn stuffed stuffing sorry and also then 
old Virginia cornbread. And um, it was probably, now that I've looked into it a lot more, probably if her cornbread really, they're trying not to do the wheat thing or the flour thing in that, um, it was not good. But mm. also, it's not, I mean, they can call it Virginia and she can be from West Virginia, whatever, and they can call that the South. Now, this is the South here in Tennessee, <laughs> and that is not cornbread. I'm so sorry, Edith. But we um, appreciate yes. the food. Cheers. The, the food delineation of what is Southern and what is not. Matt and I, as Civil War guys, always come back to Virginia's in the South. Mm. You, you made the war <laughs> fought there. You made the, the entire war was fought there and in Tennessee, basically. So, and then yes. other states are now screaming at us. Yeah. Georgia's like, what the hell? <laughs> I literally, what the hell? But oh, yeah. I will yeah. agree. That's a. a with taking the other ingredients out and trying to do cornbread, that would have been horrifying. Yeah. And um, I don't remember looking, I just remember uh, cause I jotted down what I did for her originally. Um, but then she also had the, has the recipe for tea cakes. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, she also had like a clam dip. Um, and what was the other one? Uh, her hot peppered nuts. Was another one of her recipes. I I am not I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, that will be another thing that I won't spoil as to uh, why. <laughs> anyway, I, but um, no. I also wanted to point out, <laughs> just in, in defense of your your good Southern charm here, is I definitely learned at a young age to respect that you do not mess with Southerners' tea or cornbread. You or cooking it. in general. They do it or you don't do it. Also true. Um, because I love up here people like, oh, we make sweet tea in Maryland. We, you know, we make sweet tea a certain way. And then people that I know from deep in the Bible Belt or other places in the South show up here and they are horrified at what Maryland sweet tea is. So I uh, I understand you don't do that. Um hot pepper nuts. Yeah. Like, is, like what is that? Uh I'll just I'll read the recipe, but yeah. Uh, it's just into an iron skillet over a low flame, put a pound of shelled paper shell pecans. You got to have those and add two or three lumps of butter. And those those lumps of butter need to be about the size of a walnut, according to this. And oh, then you God. stir that frequently and, and then it's kind of almost toasted. Then you add salt and cayenne pepper generously and then place in a warm oven to keep hot until served. And that came from... Um, an article, uh, a Wilson reception from the Washington Post in 1971. I wish I could try that. I can't because of food allergy. <laughs> right. it, it'll literally kill it him. It'll literally kill me, but because it has such a fantastic name, I wish I could find out what that's all about. Hmm. Um, Matt, well, don't do that. Don't do it. I'm... <laughs> no, believe me, we will not be going down that road. We will be <laughs> here from time to time. That is not one we will be pushing. On the History of Things podcast, next episode, The History of Life Saving Medicine. That's right. <laughs> In how demonstrations. The EpiPen. Yeah. And where it goes. Oh, no. <laughs> um, all right. So cool. I, I, I'm obviously not mature. So um, hot pepper nuts. I forgot the thing you said before that because I was entirely tea cakes. Was it tea cakes? Uh, tea cakes. And then also she had a clam dip. Oh, right. It was the clam dip because I looked up at our producer who is from the part of New England where they try to claim everything, especially seafood. So, Parker, did the check out? Claimed it, thumbs up. Apparently it checks out. <laughs> All right, that works for us. So, um, okay, so moving on from clam dips and, and hot pepper nuts here. Um, I want to, are we at the point now where we kind of can, can we let it out of the back? I think we should, are yes. We, Sarah, to talk about what we're going to do for our audience in the next episode? All right. Sure. So I mean, we're gonna we're gonna do something incredibly outside of the box for not just Miss Sarah, but for us as well. We are definitely to, for us. Definitely for us in a lot of ways. We are going to actually um, get down on Sarah's turf and not physically. I wish we could come down and do this in person. That would be awesome and probably a lot better for what we're gonna do. But we are gonna get in the kitchens mm-hmm. and we are gonna hang out. Ready for it? I said the moment was coming. Here it is. We're gonna hang out with the Iron Chef of history. There you go. Sarah <laughs> uh, and she is going to tell us uh, uh, and take us through cooking some of the things that uh, come out of Edith Wilson's sort of stable of of goodies, uh, culinarily speaking. Um, 
I guess let's just say it. What are we cooking? What are we what are we making for our audience? And let's talk a little bit about those things, just in the in the little sense, because I want to talk more about them as we make them for of course for our audience. But let's go with the the yummy yummy gum chocolate goodness. What are we what are we gonna get into there, Sarah? Uh well, um we are going to make a um vegetable candy bar. Uh, with dehydrated vegetables. Oh. Um, and I'm not going to spoil. Okay. Because I want to, I All think right. we can save it, but I will not spoil what that candy bar slogan was because they had a lot of weird <laughs> candy bars back in All World right. War One. I um, also, you know, when we're when we're cooking it, I can, you know, we'll t- we can talk a lot about candy bars and oh, World we're gonna, One. We're talk about our favorites. We're we're gonna get into it. We're chatting. So that that's gonna be really fun. Um, and uh, anyway, but it's got the best slogan of all time. There's also some other really weird candy bars. Um, I'll kind of give a hint that one of them has to do uh, with that. It's we're not gonna make it, but the wrapper had a roasted chicken on a plate that was on the wrapper oh my that, this is a we'll chocolate bar that. it was a chocolate bar uh, back. um that one was actually in the 20s so just a little bit later but you know uh candy bars in world war one they boomed because um the chocolate was actually a part of the rations for mm-hmm. the soldiers in european countries and at one point um during the christmas truce of 1914 they swapped candy bars but so then when the soldiers got back they're like um we're doing candy bars so it basically yes. took this like global war to make candy bars super popular that they are today um and we're going to make uh georgia kiss pudding yes oh, that sounds good and that was Woodrow Wilson's favorite dessert. And That's he ate that with I strawberry ice cream. That's the one I asked to make because it is not a secret. I will not be eating the vegetable one. I will probably take a bite out of it, but everybody knows how I feel about green food and other healthy <laughs> nom nommy vegetables. So uh, I definitely, when we were looking at the list of things we could make, when I saw the, the Georgia Kiss pudding, I was like, yes, let's do that one. So that one is a personal, well, my tum toes. <laughs> well, that is one thing. You are going to have to try it, though. I know I will. And yes, I will try Kim. I will try all of the food. I'm pretty sure I will really like the Georgia Kiss pudding. I'm I'm fairly certain I will not like the vegetable candy bar. I will try it, but let's be honest about who I am. I'm true to myself in all aspects. I will probably be like, this is good for people that like vegetables and chocolate. And I will probably want to die. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, and then, um, we're going to make the Edith Wilson's tea cakes. Um, and that recipe specifically comes from the Woodrow Wilson house museum. Um, oh, nice. it was, uh, I believe served even at the white house, um, prior to the rationing situation. So that's uh, what we're going to make. Since these episodes are going to be coming out in October and in November of this year, specifically the cooking one will be out in November, I expect to see everybody's holiday meals flush with what we're making here on the History Things podcast. I want to see your veggie bars. I want to see your tea cakes and your pudding. So let's get out there. Let's get into the history and let's make this stuff. Also, for our listeners out there, when you do, you know, conclude your journey with us, with Miss Sarah, hop onto her channel and stay on the journey mm-hmm. so that you can, A, learn a lot of really cool things and take this amazing breath of fresh air out of always talking about the blood and guts of history. I mean, I love that this is centering around the thing that is the most unifying stuff in the world. Food. So um, let's get let's do everything we can to not only lift you up, but engage in the subject and help people realize that history isn't just studying the doom and gloom and the dreadful politics of war and everything. It is it is full of the fun stuff as well. And cooking is something people like, most people like to do. I'll be honest. I don't. I suck at it, and I don't like to do things I suck at. <laughs> But um, it is something that everybody gets down with. So I am very, very excited uh, to not only um, do this for our show and for your audience, but to hope hope we open some doors, I guess, to get people connected to something that they might not even know they needed in their lives. Sarah, I didn't know I needed your account in my life, but once I found it, I was like, 
Yes. Hmm. So every time I do the doom scroll, I stop when I see cooking with the first ladies so I can make sure I listen and learn something cool and uh, and just in, enjoy the change of pace from what I normally study every day. So uh, I thank you for that. Um, how do our listeners follow you on your odyssey and adventure through social media and history and cooking? Um, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube channels, where do they find you? Uh, well, first of all, thank you guys so much. That was so sweet. But <laughs> Um, no, it's, I, my person, my Instagram for this project is just at cooking with the first ladies. So real simple. Mm -hmm. Um, other than that, um, I don't really have anything. My husband's trying to talk me into doing my own YouTube channel, but I'm not there yet. Uh, but in regards to YouTube, um, uh, like I said, kind of earlier is the national first ladies library. YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, has a cooking with the first ladies playlist and it's everything from, 2020 when I started through now, including um, recordings of all of the different live programs that I've done so far. Um, and then they also, um, through their uh, Eventbrite page, is where you can see upcoming live programs. Um, and again, those are quarterly, so um, there'll be one in January if this is airing whatever so um those are the places that you can go but it's just at cooking with the first ladies on Instagram follow 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 make sure you get there hit that button and make sure you tell her that the history things podcast sent you hmm. but not like the mafia don't tell her like that it doesn't <laughs> doesn't work like that just make sure you let her know that if you if you're new to, to her uh adventure that you heard it here first and that uh that way we know we enlisted something good for you uh, other than hang out and hopefully not waste an hour and a half of your time. You're hoping you had as good a time as we did tonight. Um, I had a great time. Perfect. So. Good to hear. Well, Very good. Uh, we're going to get out of here for the History Things podcast. Uh, we have a lot uh, coming up. Season five is right around the corner. Obviously, yeah, we is. have this amazing thing we're going to attempt to do. You're going to be awesome. We've seen you. We'll be attempting. <laughs> we are going to be the ones attempting to do this. So uh, we highly, uh, we're highly, we highly aware of the fact that we are not on our turf when we are in the kitchen. Um, I will be attempting not to burn down your kitchen. So I do love this house. It took me a long time to get to it, but I uh, no, I mean, I'm very excited for, for that. Season five is going to be huge. Uh, you're definitely going to want to tune in in a few weeks for our, uh, I guess, our end of year. 2023 yep. season four went by really fast. Yeah. Really fast. And you know, we always like to close with a good one and a heavy hitter. And so, Sarah, having you here to close at our year, mm, success, chef's kiss. This has been a great chat. I can't wait to continue it again. And then, you know, take this momentum and steamroll into our big, and honestly, historic for us. You know, podcasts getting to five years, five seasons is, it's no small feat. And we're on the, we're on the cusp. On the cusp. We're on the yep. cusp, buddy. Um, yes, so congratulations. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank Great. you for being a part of our journey. And thank you to all of our listeners out there for continuously being a part of our journey and helping elevate us and grow us. Those um, reviews and five-star ratings cannot help enough. We thank you for doing it. Keep doing it. When you're done with our page, jump over to Sarah's page. Hit those, whatever, however you can review a page on Instagram, because I think there's some way now. Maybe, maybe mm. not. Or at least follow. Follow, just shout it out. Spread the word, but do whatever you can to support the people you are enjoying and learning from, because it will only help them do a better job for you. It helps for us, helps for Sarah, helps for anybody out there that you're following along with. So, for the History Things Podcast, I'm Pat McGuire. This is my co-host, Matt Borders. For our guest today, Sarah Morgan, host of Cooking with the First Lady, saying we will catch you all later! Have a good night. on Facebook and Instagram at the History Things Podcast for all the latest news and exclusives. Make sure to also follow Pat and Matt on their social medias at History Things with Pat and at Matt Borders Books. Have a question, comment, or compliment for the show? Send us an email at historythingspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show.